welcome to review and thoughts the matrix for the matrix resurrections now so real quick off topic absolutely loved bob vid's cinema sin is still terrible make sure to check it out i get why it's difficult for bob to do these videos and i thank him for his sacrifice I realize this video is long, I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. Also, if you're only interested in the review, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video. This is length. Check the time codes in the description box. I watched this in a theater because where I live, COVID is sufficiently under control that they can open theaters. If you do not live in an area where COVID is under control, please do not watch this in a theater. No movie is worth risking spreading COVID. Even if you think you yourself be safe, there's probably someone you might accidentally spread it to that you don't want to spread it to. Now, I realize I am three weeks late, but this, you know, they, they closed down the theaters. They just reopened them. This was the first day it was, yeah, that they showed this movie at all here. So, now, I am currently dealing with some back pain, but still have a lot to say about the movies that I watched. I'm going to speak faster, and so my back feels better. I start this video with a review where if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so, and... Hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip it until you lower my index finger. Also, please note, I will not warn before spoilers for earlier entries in this franchise, including Enter the Matrix, Animatrix, and if I think of something, possibly The Path of Neo as well. I will warn if I spoil other Wachowski sister stuff. Also, as soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers for this movie. And it will continue to have spoilers for the first three and uh, yeah this movie is a soft reboot I try to grade any soft reboot on a curve the reason why is because I like not being miserable which is what I will be if I focus on all the ways that it is inferior to the original is any soft reboot as good as the one or multiple movies that it is a reboot re soft reboot of almost definitely not if that exists then I don't know of it it's a soft reboot because they figured that that's a better way to ensure making a lot of money off it, but that doesn't have to mean that's that it's automatically bad, hence grading on a curve. Like, literally, in this movie, they straight up, you know, as they, apparently, Lana Wachowski was told, they were going to do this movie with her or without her. And, yeah, that's, I mean, that really does tell you the... the level of respect to that so you know she went ahead and put that in the movie in the movie they also say we're gonna make it with you or without you so just you know you might as like yeah I have to get something off my chest real quick uh, actually yeah before I like I said I might be I might speak faster for at least some of this video since my back I will try to enunciate clearly because you know, as long as you don't see it clearly, then whoever's watching can just, like, play it back on YouTube at a slower rate, and still, but it doesn't work if you don't enunciate it, obviously. Anyway, real quick, I've seen several people say that the problem with this movie is that it's too woke, that that's where they made a mistake. There's definitely problems with this movie. The problem is not. The, the wokeness is not part of, of that problem. And it's like, honestly, if you think that there is a movie out there that legitimately is ruined by wokeness, please put the title in the comments and I will legitimate, I will consider it. But I've just, I, I don't know of any movie that was ruined by wokeness. There are bad movies that have element like, you're never going to hear me defend the 2004 Catwoman movie, but it's not bad because it focuses so much on women. It's bad because it does a bad job with focusing so much on, it, you know, it's so, it's so superficial and nasty towards women, you know, about how the, oh, you know, who cares about the, the, the negative side effects of this, of this thing, but, oh, it makes women ugly. That's a problem. And, the villain's motivation and this whole thing. Anyway. The thing I have to get off my chest. 
this movie is not ruined by being very leftist. And I, I think it might be time for, for the people who, if every single time something is rebooted that they care about and there's leftism in there, they, they zero in on say, that's the problem. It was fine before it got so left-wing. Okay. <laughs> the Matrix was always left-wing. Star Wars was always left-wing. Terminator was always left-wing. This is, it's, it's really silly to, to say, oh, you know, that's, that's the problem. Clearly. Look, the moment that they put out a Rambo movie or a Die Hard movie that is like, or Conan that is like you know left wing I mean I'm not I'm not gonna personally you know I will probably agree with its politics then but I 100% agree that is a franchise that did not used to be left wing you know those are three properties that are decidedly car you know conservative and not left wing but like it's baked into the DNA of Terminator Star Wars and Matrix that they're left wing like it you can't even you can't give a description of any of these franchises without vocalizing left wing you know just just briefly so matrix the heroes are a bunch of outsiders who fight the system to try to tear it down because it oppresses people you know, Terminator, a young woman saves the world by being a good mother. You know, the, the, you know, rather than that being, you know, those movies have never said that the only thing a woman is good for is giving birth and, and being a mother. They, they say that it's something women can do and it's, you know, it's, it's powerful, it's strong. And Star Wars is about a bunch of multicultural people from all over, you know, ga uh, assembling to fight white supremacists. Like, it is... And also, I saw some people say that this movie, Matrix Resurrections, ruined their childhood. If you watched a Matrix movie when you were still a child... That's that wasn't supposed to happen. Like these are these are movies made for adults. Like I I don't know how you anyway. It has I I have now gotten it off my chest. Back to my notes. I don't have any personal issues with almost any filmmakers, and I almost never let any issues I have interfere with my review analysis. This movie did not ruin my life, my childhood, my day, the rest of the franchise for me. Now, let's see. Right, so, personally, I think it's fine for people who aren't big fans of a property to review a property, comment on it, stuff like that. But I do know that for some people, it is extremely important that only fans do. So, yeah, I, I will be criticizing this movie as I criticized. You know, I have I have at least something negative to say about all of them, although not very much for the first one. But I am a really big fan, and uh, yeah, the as you can see, the display for the uninitiated. Let's see, I'm never. Yeah, that that thing there, you know, between revolutions and animatrix, that thing there is a box set that has all three movies and the Animatrix and just like is wealth of documentaries about all three of the movies you know it includes the the Matrix Revisited but it also has ones that I'm not sure you can even buy separately when when I got the the box set I it, it was the only way to, to get but 
you know, for those who, who think he, got, he bought all three movies twice, the box set was a, a present. That was a gift that I got. But yeah, the other, all of the other ones I bought and paid for with my own money, and I am very happy that I did. In the early to mid-2000s, I lived and breathed Matrix. Countless hours spent on Matrix Pizza, Matrix Mortal Kombat, other parodies of very varying quality. I watched the trilogy, Animatrix, played both Enter and Path games. I did not play the MMORPG. That's just not my genre. It, it sounds super interesting. It's too bad that they... They apparently shut it down after not very long, if I understand, if, if I recall correctly, but, yeah. The, the, the overall idea of, like, all these different factions, and, like, one of the factions are, like, c Cypherites, so they, they agree with Cypher and they're trying to accomplish that, and some, uh, some factions are machines, some factions... I thought I turned that thing off, never mind, that, that was the wireless ah what's it called again external speakers turning off because i haven't used them for for 10 minutes anyway yeah so the the yeah the the game sounded interesting but just yeah i never have and i probably never will play an mmorpg anyway I made a, you know, uh, yeah, I played the, there were, there were a number of Max Payne 1 and 2 mods, yeah, I believe for both of them, about Matrix, I actually recreated the, the subway from, from the first movie, and did the, did the cinematic of the, the western standoff thing, and the whole, yeah, and I also, you know, <sighs> It ended up not quite coming together, but I did want to make a StarCraft, you know, yeah, a bit, build a, a level for StarCraft based on the the breach of the docks from Revolutions. You know, basically, you can probably see where. I'm, so basically, yeah, if you if you know StarCraft, I was going to put the, it, yeah. I was going to make wraiths be like sentinels and the, oh, I forget what they're, goliath. And the goliaths were going to be the APUs. And yeah, you have to, you know, fend off enough of them. But yeah, just then I, I couldn't quite crack it. I couldn't quite get it to work. Anyway, so ranking the movies worst to best. I'm going to, yeah, starting with the, the first three. And by the end of this review, I intend to arrange, I intend to put this movie in the, the rankings. But anyway, worst to best, Revolutions, 7 out of 10, Reloaded, 7 out of 10, and Original, 10 out of 10. And ranking the two games I played from worst to best, best Path of Neo, 7, Enter the Matrix, 7. So, content warning and or trigger warning, this movie features... Some of the following, and I'm going to be discussing at least some of the following potentially triggering content. Torture, kidnapping, gaslighting, mental illness, drugs, xenophobia, murder, body horror, suicide, uh, yeah, yeah, that covers it. So, I think... Some of it, some of this potentially triggering content could have been removed without the movie losing a lot. But overall, I do think that, you know, it doesn't really, it's not just there for, for no good reason. So, I forgot to look up the, yeah, I'll just real quick, it won't take long. I meant to look up the rating before, and then I forgot. Okay. 
the movie is rated PG-13. Yeah, yeah, I guess a lot of action movies today are, even though the first three were all R-rated, so it's the Animatrix. But as far as I can tell, yeah, PG-13. And that means the video will also be. So, this video is not going to contain any clips of any kind. The most visual it gets is when I saw sometimes act something out. So feel free to watch something visual and clips from the movie in another tab. I won't mind. Now, the I will be saying negative things in this video, but it's it's not out of bitterness. I don't feel like the movie wasted my time. Don't be forced me to watch it or to make this video. It's not that I'm upset at how it compares to the the first three movies or other parts of the franchise. Trailers and other marketing. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things I say in this are for a criticism based on budget, when it came out, what it's trying to achieve, etc. So yeah, in a number of ways, this is like the original trilogy, I guess, especially the the first movie. So I'm not going to mention all the things where they're similar. I'm going to talk about the ways that they're different from one another so that I'm not just repeating myself. Now, you do need to have watched the, the three movies that came before this one, and you need to have them fresh in your memory. You know, this is not like if you watch the movies you know, 18 years ago, when when the second and third movie came out, and you were like, mm -hmm, that was okay, and then never watch them again, and you're sitting down, you're going to watch this movie, you're going to be lost if you don't re-watch them, if, if they're not fresh in your mind. I, I re-watched them just recently, which, you know, I don't really need an excuse to do that anyway, but yeah. And, I mean, I think... I, I would argue that at least some of the time the movie this movie is better for the the fact that there are things that you can only follow if you if you watch the the other ones you know it, it builds on them Since we're still dealing with Corona, I want to say during this video, it is possible that I will touch my face. I want to show you. I washed my hands since the last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before going out. So yeah, this is my very first viewing, and I got done watching it very recently. You know, as as soon as I got back from the theater, I hit record pretty much immediately. So. I suppose I let's see there's not that much you can say about the plot without starting to spoil what I will say is that certain things that happened in the first movie appear to possibly be happening again and Neo is now you know, yeah, seems to be living an ordinary life as Thomas A. Anderson. And he's seeing a therapist. And he has, you know, yeah, he has a job. And I think that is pretty much what I can say without spoiling anything. Now, on one, on the one hand, you know, when when I first heard that this was coming out, I was like, there's already too many Matrix movies. There's, you know, before this movie was released, there were two Matrix movies, too many. But, on the other hand, you know, Reload and Revolutions were not as interesting as the first one, in part because the first one completely surprised us with the twist that the world we perceived as the real world was not the real world. And yes, 100% agreed, Reloaded tried to do something similar, you know, when, when it showed us that Neo is far from the first one, you know, and, and the, 
like, you know, some people were terrified that Zion was going to turn out to just be another Matrix. It isn't literally another Matrix, but it is, you know, the, the Matrix was not the only form of control that the machines had over humanity. So, you know, it did do that, but it, it just wasn't as, it, it didn't work anywhere near as well. You know, I, I think they had idea. It, it, Matrix 1 and Star Wars Episode 4, basically, the the people making them wanted to make more than just the one movie, but the the studio basically browbeat them and said, no, you're, you're only going to make this one movie. You know, so they threw everything they had in there. They, they kind of made a movie that was very difficult to do a very satisfying sequel to, and when the movie was a, uh, was a huge success, of course they were going to make more, and don't get me wrong, Episode 5, Star Wars Episode 5, freaking amazing. My point is, when they when it came to making Episode 6, they were like, well, what are we going to, we still need a Death Star, I guess we're just going to do a bigger Death Star than the last time, because originally the Death Star was not supposed to appear until the third movie, but the, the studio, yeah. And I th I think there were there, there's definitely ways to make more than one Matrix movie without it being you know this really awkward situation that it is now. But they thought that they weren't gonna get to make more than one movie, so they gave it an ending that's very difficult to follow up on without just feeling like it's it's. You know, it's it, the problem with the sequels is not the fact that they subvert our expectations. That was something that worked incredibly well for the first one. It's just, yeah, I, I, I should move on. I have a lot of things. Anyway, now that uh, you know Neo and Trinity died in the third film and are back for the fourth one, you know, the, the mystery was a big part of the appeal of the first movie. You know, yeah, it seems like this movie might be the most interesting of the three sequels. And you know what, in some ways it is, there's definitely some really, really interesting things here. And Yes, the mo this movie does explain how is it that Neo and Trinity are back after the events of Revolutions. So You know, they died. We saw them die with our own eyes. You know, the, the, the visuals of them dying, the electrical signals were interpreted by our brains. We remember. So, so, yeah. And I, I think this is what Diz Deacon refers to as an R.E. word sequel title, which, as he points out, is often a bad sign. And, yeah. So, let's see. The, um, yeah, so based on the trailers, yeah, I thought it looked like this movie would have too much story to have a satisfying ending. And it's not quite clear if they're making more than one movie. It seems like it's going to be impossible to not undo the meaningful sacrifice of Neo and Trinity at the end of Revolutions. And... Yeah, I mean, I haven't watched all of the Wachowski sisters' movies, but... Have they made a really, really good movie? since the first Matrix movie. If if they have, then I don't know of it. I, there's, like, some that I've stayed away from because, the, you know, they were said to be so bad, of these movies. Now, according to IMDb Trivia, according to Lana Wachowski, her decision to bring back Neo and Trinity for the sequel was inspired by the loss of both of her parents, who died only five weeks apart, and a close friend. The writing process was her way of comforting herself in the face of death. She also defines Neo and Trinity 
as the two most important characters in her life. But Lily Wachowski, on the other hand, her decision not to return to the Matrix was due to the grief she was in for the same reasons. I respect that, and I think creative expression can be an incredibly effective and important way to deal with emotions in, in general, you know, and grieving is one of the most difficult things we'll ever do, and it is something all of us have to do, and yet uh, there's not enough good media that goes into that. And yeah, I can I can 100% understand how this movie, making this movie, was a way to help process her grief over people she lost that were close to her. 100%. Now, YMS said it looks like another Wachowski train wreck, so it should be fun. I haven't been, you know, like, like I said, I just got back from the theater and hit record, so I he, he talked about the movie on uh, right on the tip of my tongue, Sardon Sardonicast. I haven't listened to that yet, but I have, you know, the links in my favorites, so I'll, I'll listen through that, and if I have something to, to say in response, I'll record it in a week and and put up a shorter video where I talk about some, you know, there's there's a bunch of people who've made, since the movie has been out for so long, there's already, like, visual, you know, vi yeah, video essays about it, I think that was what I meant to say. Not only, you know, videos with commentary. Now, I've long been a fan of Philip Kindred Dick, absolutely love his work, and I was very happy with how the first Matrix movie adapted some of his ideas. You know, for, I, I like to say that if, you know, sadly, he died, R.I.P., he died in, I want to say, 1981 or so, I... Uh, he, so, you know, he, he wasn't alive when this movie came out. But if he had been asked to... Yeah, actually, he did... Um, he died before Blade Runner. Yeah, 1982. He died before Blade Runner came out, which was based somewhat on his excellent novel. Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? And yeah, so so it's we, we don't know for sure if he how how he would have felt about that movie. But anyway, if he had been alive in the late nineties, and someone you know a studio said we're going to uh, I forget how many million was it seventy million? I feel like I remember it as being seven. You know, they came to him and said there you know. We're going we're gonna to make a 70 million blockbuster. We want you to write it. He could very well have written The Matrix. Like, there are aspects of it that would have been significantly different. Don't get me wrong. But this idea that, like, the world that we perceive right now is actually just this, this you know, induced hallucination kind of thing, shared dream... And we're actually, you know, we're being, like, taken advantage of and, and like, not, not harvested. That's not quite the word. But, you know, the, the, this kind of just, yeah. And that, like, there are, that, that there's this conflict that's, you know, under the, the you know, out, yeah, not, not visible to normal people. You know, these, these things... He could have written that, you know, the, the, very clearly the Wachowski sisters were very inspired by him, among many other, you know, tons of influences for that first Matrix movie. But yeah, he could, he could very well have written, you know, a, a bunch of his works have been adapted with varying degrees of, of success and such, but yeah. So I was hoping that this movie would also have interesting ideas that he could have come up with, and yeah, it did. 
and yeah okay so this is kind of spoiler so yeah spoiler for the movie at least one of the trailers implies that Neo and Trinity have been reborn and are uncovering repressed memories of each other which is the kind of thing that PKD would write and yeah no more spoilers but that's very much yeah so the you know a, a number of people have read the original movie as being about uh, you know trans identity and uh, you know Lily Wachowski has co confirmed that that is accurate and there are some things in this that kind of go further with that I don't uh, I, I'm not going to speak to, you know, I'm, I'm not trans myself. I'm cis. So I, I don't know if, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say whether or not trans individuals should be happy with how much the movie does. I hope they are. I hope they, they find that it's, um, you know, much more fulfilling. experience than the original you know it's so it's wild that the first movie has been co-opted by these toxic you know ridiculous conservatives who say oh you know the real red pill what you really got to realize is that it's been a while since I did so they like think that women are the cause of all problems when it's like I, I how do you read that into the movie like you have to be looking for it like you went into the movie hating women and the movie is like you have to fight the, the this evil entity that's in charge so fight women no no how, how did you get it's just it's it's absurd it's it's but apparently it's because like the guy who came up with it I can never remember it was either that his mother refused to give him like diarrhea medication or she forced him to take diarrhea medication and that's you know apparently that was the wrong you know she made the wrong call and that sucks I you know I definitely empathize with you know but that's not that shouldn't tell you that all women are evil that should tell you that some parents make terrible decisions. I 100% I think we should do more to make sure that parents like the you know if if you if you are raising a child I think you should have to research certain things and look into certain things read certain books you know to make sure that you don't abuse your offspring. But like my mother abused me as well repeatedly that does that hasn't made me hate women that just means I'm a bit more careful when I deal with authority figures you know that's a lesson you could take from that some authority figures abuse their authority anyway so let's see the yeah the idea for the first matrix was for the character of switch to be a trans individual you know, she was assigned female in the real world, but her perception of herself in the Matrix was male. Their their perception was male. It's kind of sad that studio executives nixed that. It's even sadder that, honestly, a lot of mo mainstream audiences probably would have balked at that idea, and the movie might have been substantially less successful because of their response. And let's see, then I wrote, I would love to see that idea realized in this movie or a sequel to it. So yeah, I guess I won't give, uh, okay, yeah, so, spoilers, there's not anything directly 100% like that, but there are things in this where, like, multiple individuals occupy the same body, and someone will perceive themselves, will, will be assigned one thing and perceive themselves as another, so... There is, there is definitely some of that. Now, no more spoilers 
for the time being. I mean, how is that? Like, that's where we draw the line. Like, it's not, you know, that that in order to, to escape the Matrix, you have to pull this massive tube out of your, you know, that goes way down your throat. It's not all the, the it's not waking up in a tub of goo. It's not like Neo vomiting on the Nebuchadnezzar. It's not the, the horrifying truth that the movie posits. But no, the, the idea, is, I'm, I'm saying, I'm partially saying hypothetically, but I'm also saying like what the studio executives agreed to. You know, all these ridiculous, all, all these really messed up things are in the actual movie, but the idea that someone identifies as a different gender than they were assigned at birth that's just that's unacceptable you know audiences can't handle that all this other stuff no problem now i love the first film i love a lot about both sequels i love the flawed into the matrix i'm indifferent to path of neo i love most of animatrix and i love the comics the matrix comics that i read if you can get your hands on those if you're at all into the matrix and comics you know some of them are absolutely amazing I don't think I was able to get my hands on all of them, but there were a lot of really good ones. And it's, you know, the Animatrix and the comics, they help deepen the world without just being, like, really, really similar to, you know, that, that was one of the things with the, you know, the moment that you make a sequel to something like The Matrix, it's just, you know, you have to deliver some of, of the same. Actually, I recently, I guess it was earlier today, actually. Yeah, I, I forget exactly where, but I read someone saying that one of the problems with the sequels was that the, you know, the noir element of the original is gone. There is some noir going on in this one. So that is something that the, you know, Lana took to heart. She realized that people didn't like that. The, the sequels weren't really noir. Now, I would say that some of the problems with the, the Matrix movies and, you know, the problems that are especially bad in Reload and Revolutions, I think, you know, they, you could... The, the, the answer to what, where, where they came from, why they're that bad, is that the sisters, you know, they, they used to do a, a lot of comic work. I want to say they wrote a bunch of comics. And this, like, this thing of characters giving long monologues that are about theme and character, not necessarily forwarding the plot, and long, extensive action scenes that don't necessarily have consequences, they work in comics, and they're, they work a lot less in movies. And... I would say that this movie, I'm not sure I would say this movie has the, I, th I think this movie handles it somewhat better than the sequels, but it's a little difficult for me to say for sure for a reason I will get into, yeah, soon in this video, but yeah, you know, and that, that is like, if you if you watch the the first movie and you think about how they they used to write comics, you can really see it because like this thing of the it you know it starts with like the the opening, literally the visuals of the opening. You could get right out of a comic book, you know, the slow zoom in on something that's important, but you don't yet know exactly what's going on or why, and it's yeah, and the lines they might as well be like word bubbles or, or that, that kind of thing. And the first chunk of the movie, you know, there's, there's several things and it's just, you keep having more answer. A question is you want answered. And if you're reading a comic book, you know, if, if, if you're about to buy a comic book, you might open it and, you know, go through a couple of pages, see if it's anything interesting. And because of that, a lot of comic books will have very compelling openings that really ask, or, yeah, not all of them ask questions, but they they set things up that you really want to see 
what the the payoff, what the carry through will be. And that's something the movie doesn't really like. You would think that the first maybe thirty minutes of the first Matrix, like it's basically constantly expecting you to just turn around and leave, you know, because it keeps there's constantly something that's super interesting. And it it does it really well. I'm I'm not saying I'm not calling it bad pacing. Now let's see. So so yeah, Nerdist and Screen Crush, I think some others said the movie will be meta, will be it, it won't be exploiting nostalgia, it will be commenting on how nostalgia is exploited these days. I yeah, I would I would say so. I, I don't I know some people have said that oh it's just nostalgia bait and it's not there's definitely some nostalgia going on, but I wouldn't really call it just like exploitative of it the way that some other. Now, let's see. So yeah, the for those who might not know, there are certain franchises where. You know, I I was pretty much guaranteed to to go and watch this, which still doesn't mean you know, I'm not saying anybody forced me to, and I don't. I understand why some people, you know, get really angry about movies and and feel like they were forced to because it's a franchise they care about. But I don't want to make videos where I get angry. Now. So yeah, the this movie fares pretty well on diversity. You know, it is still focused. I, I, let's see, if I understand correctly, technically Keanu Reeves isn't quite white, but he passes for white as white. So yeah, you know, technically it's still about this this white dude, but there are you know the the. Yeah, it's not really a um, spoiler to say, you know, there are multiple women in the cast, and some of them are not white. And, but, but yeah, you know, it's pretty terrible that I have to say following, but, you know, if anybody out there hasn't watched this movie yet, you know, some people won't watch this if they aren't assured of the following. Not every straight white cis man in this film is depicted as being evil, inferior, etc. There are major characters that fall into those categories. And, you know, yeah, there are, there is one or more straight white cis men in this that are depicted as being evil. Now, before I start talking about talking details about the technical aspects, let me start by saying people are very talented. I'm not calling into question anyone's skill or enthusiasm. And also, I'm I'm not I don't know why some people seem to insist. I feel like if you if you're capable of verbalizing the following, you should have you know, you should also be capable of stopping and saying, wait, that makes no sense. I'm not gonna post it on the internet. But a number of people you know, this, the new Star Wars, the new Terminator, the new this, that, and the other thing, they watch it, and they're like, this, this isn't anywhere near as good. Are they purposefully sabotaging? Why would they be purposefully sabotaging it? That doesn't make any sense. I mean, Lana Wachowski cares way more about these characters than any of us fans do. Anyway, so this was written by, among others, Lana Wachowski. Let's see. Yeah, she she also wrote Jupiter Ascending, Cloud Atlas, which are the only two that they've directed that I haven't watched. They also wrote Speed Racer, which it's it's a it's a failed experiment in my opinion. It. I see what they were going for. 
when I get frustrated. Uh, movies with Mikey did a really excellent video on that movie. They also wrote V for Vendetta, which not the best adaptation, but a very good movie. And obviously the trilogy and Bound and Assassins. Bound is also an excellent movie. I remember Assassins as being pretty decent. Like it it's a mid-90s action movie. Am I remembering right? It's one of the stars Sly. And I wanna say that uh the Desperado. Antonio Banderas also plays a really large role in that. You know, it's a mid-90s action movie starring Sly and the Desperado. It's it's, it's not amazing, but yeah. It it is kind of wild how like they can write something that's that it's it's a fairly like that that movie doesn't feel like it has these big ideas on its mind. I guess Bound doesn't either really. It it basically like they had these ideas and they didn't and they waited for when they could dive into them instead of just sprinkling them throughout these you know, some directors can't keep their mouth shut. No matter how straightforward of a movie they're trying to make, they're going to put in something, you know, one, one of their ideas, even if it doesn't work. Anyway, it, yeah, the other two writers are David, David Mitchell and Alexander Herman. Now, David Mitchell, let's see. Right, he wrote the Cloud Atlas novel. So there's a connection there, and he wrote a short. He has a TV writing credit. He appears as an actor in Cloud Atlas. And he was on Sense 8, the TV series, playing himself, I guess. And right, and Alexander Herm Hem Hammond. I don't know why I thought there was an R there, but I did. Alexander Hammond wrote something called Love Island. Wrote some Sense Eight. Appeared on Sense Eight as himself. And yeah. The writing definitely, there are times where the movie is too in love with this whole meta thing and like fairly early on, like it, I don't know exactly why they made the decision, but I would definitely say that the early on the movie spends at least a little bit too long on this whole thing of the the yeah the the meta aspect hard to say without spoiling but yeah now this movie does introduce new concepts you know con concepts that were not previously part of the matrix lore and some of them it you know the the they just explain it extremely quickly and then just move on others they they will spend a little longer explaining i think they do a fine enough job of of the you know so several of these ideas they're not that difficult to understand it's just that we we need to know that he, there's something here you know, this is this is a thing that's different from the way things used to be in the Matrix movies. So, you know, it needs to be stated. Yes, this is intentional. It's not, you know, we're we're not just ignoring rules we set up. We've we've written some new rules, and here's a brief explanation of why it does perfectly fine with that. I think plot twists. There's definitely. Some of the plot twists kind of feel like they don't fully pay off. 
and I don't know if I, I don't know if it's right to say that they were easy to guess because I'm not 100% sure that they were even supposed to be like things to guess at all, or if it's just that they were like they kind of revealed it really early on and then just wait. They they don't confirm the reveal, I guess is the yeah. I will say, you know, it's not one of those movies that once you learn a certain twist, the movie just completely falls apart. Now, the direction was handled entirely by Lana Wachowski, and I already mentioned the various movies that she and her sister directed. Right, so here's a little bit from IMDb Trivia. When working on the previous Matrix films, Lana Wachowski had everything planned out with storyboards, used as little natural lighting as possible. She notes that this film employed a different approach. She collaborated more with the crew and employed as many of their suggestions as she could and used more natural lighting in the film. Unusually for a motion picture, the composers were involved in the writer's room that Wachowski had set up for the production at the end of the pit. With this access, they were able to compose a version of the score before anything was filmed. The rhythms of that score guided the filming and editing of some of the scenes. I... I I really don't like criticizing when some... Like, that's... That's such a great way to approach, like, a collaborative effort. You know, don't, don't buy into the... You know, I, I forget exactly who it was that said it, but someone made the point that the auteur filmmaker is a myth. There's no such thing as one person defining absolutely everything. You know, that, that's just, there's, there's too many different aspects of the movie for any one person to, to you know, come up with everything. What, what it is is that, you know, when, when you think of an auteur director very likely what it is is there are you know the department heads really understand what the auteur director wants and so they can deliver it's it's not literally that they somehow manage to completely control every single aspect it's just it simply isn't possible you know a lot of these they're working at the same time you know, it, it would be impossible. No, no, like, you'd have to be, like, Nightcrawler or Professor X or something in order to communicate with all the different, you know, as they're working all at the same time. Anyway, so I really don't like criticizing, you know, a, a process like that, but I can't help but wonder if that might be why this movie isn't quite as good as the trilogy in a number of ways. Like, it really isn't... Yeah, the, because like the the music and the the filming and editing of, of scenes in this are not as good as in the trilogy. Like as bad as Reloaded and Revolutions got, there was always this incredible visual artistry on display, and that's just not in in this. Like it's not. It's not badly done, but it is nowhere near as good, as as well done, as the trilogy. Now, quoting some fellow critics, this is closer to Nightmare on Street 7 than Star Wars Episode 7. Very true. The music is nowhere near as good as the music of the trilogy. Too many references to the trilogy too much meta I don't know if I think that's that big of a problem but there definitely is you know in some parts of the movie there are, there's a lot of meta going on and there's a lot of references and I yeah I, I the movie would be better if it was toned down I, I don't think it ruins the movie but it would have been better if it toned down. And yeah, some some critics say it's incredibly bad. 
some said it has a good story in the first hour of the movie is good yeah some some say it feels like the movie is making fun of itself it hates itself it has no self respect i wouldn't go quite that far but i don't know i there are characters in this that love the, the trilogy i guess what people are saying is that those characters it feels like we're supposed to laugh at those characters and as such the the movie is saying that it's ridiculous to love the trilogy like that I don't know I I don't really get a feeling of like disrespect from anyway and some say the movie has no depth it's just a popcorn flick I I'm not 100% sure I I um I think there might be things in this one that just at first glance appear to be, you know, not appear to not have depth. But there's a lot of depth in several of their movies that went un. Ah, what's the word? That, that people didn't realize for a while, so I'm hesitant to say that they've made even a single movie that just has no depth. I realize I did say that about... I, I want to clarify, I'm not saying Bound has no depth. I'm saying it doesn't have, like, deep philosophical themes like the Matrix the trilogy. Assassins, I do feel relatively confident in saying it's not a particularly deep movie. It's just... It gets the job done, you know, it's a mid-90s dumb action movie, and it's fun to watch. You know, I've watched that movie like five or six times. I think I would have picked up on it by now if there was some, like, hidden depth. Now, some people say that this movie is better than the third one. In, in some ways, I agree. The movie does not look like the first three, which wouldn't be a problem but the movie has an uninspired look that is very true i parts of this movie like you could i it is my opinion that you can take any like from the from the trilogy even even the cutscenes for enter the matrix you could take and show to someone who hasn't already seen it, and they would still be able to say, okay, that's related to the Matrix. That's definitely very Matrix-like. And that's just, with with this, like, there's a couple of aspects where you can tell, okay, that's very Matrix-y, but, yeah. Terrible martial arts. Yeah. A disappointing and muddled return to the franchise that lacks the grit and urgency of the originals. Yes, very true. And, yeah, Keanu Reeves doesn't do as much, ah, what's it called, martial arts in this. It's more this, like, I, yeah, so minor spoiler for this movie. In place of Keanu Reeves using martial arts, he's basically, like, he has these telekinetic abilities, so he's like, you know, others have said it's like he's force pushing. Yeah, very true. No more spoilers for the time being. It's it's really too bad because it it's not just like it the movie the movie does have ideas. There are some really interesting ideas in this movie, and like there are some I've you know I've I've talked a little bit about how. In some ways, it's not as good as the, you know, Reloaded and Revolutions, but it is, like, there are things in this movie that I haven't seen in any other movie, you know, and, and there are things that, like, there, there are multiple big ideas in this movie that fit in the Matrix world that the trilogy you know, yeah, the, the first movie sets up and the the entire trilogy is set in, but that we haven't seen before. And 
yeah, like it, it really, like I would, I would say that this has way more new ideas than Star Wars Episode Seven. You know, this is much more daring and willing to go new places than that movie is, and. Yeah, the, you know, I, I I can believe that Lana was told that if she didn't make the movie, they were going to make it without her. But it doesn't feel like just she, she just grit her teeth and fought through it. She did have really interesting ideas here. Which is actually, I mean, considering that, you know, by the time we got to Matrix revolutions like some of the action scenes actually feel kind of like they actually kind of derivative of themselves like the the um, coke room is that what it's called the the before they get into the nightclub hell when they fight through you know there's this small lobby area and it just feels like a meh retread of the lobby shootout in the first movie which when that came out, that was, you know, we hadn't seen anything quite like that, but then, yeah, and, and the, yeah, but, but yeah, this movie has new ideas for this, so, yeah. Now, the opening does a, a pretty good job, like, Yeah, it's it's not a spoiler to say when this movie opens, you can tell that like there's there's stuff that's very reminiscent of the first movie, but there's also something going on, some something else going on, something different. And yeah, it it legitimately does pique your interest. I'm not gonna give away whether the ending is happy or sad. It does fit with what came before. I don't love the ending. I I think it's it's a frustrating ending. It doesn't really rely on Deus Ex Machina or other convenient writing. Now, this movie does have one post credit scene. I hesitate to say that you should. <laughs> I don't think it's worth the wait. I don't think it's worth waiting for the end credits for. And I wrote down, yeah, there's 11 minutes of end credits before the post credit scene. And it's just... I get what they were going for. I think it was a... I think it was misjudged, basically. Now, it is a movie where, like, some parts of it are more enjoyable to watch than others. Oops. And... I do think the, the movie does a decent job of not just being... It's not just the first movie again, or the first three movies again. It does have new stuff. Which brings us to the cast. The, the movie definitely does get you to care about some of the characters. And... I mean, it's kind of... Yeah. It's hard to go too much into. Let's see. I will say that there is a villain character in this, and the actor just really digs in and and like 
loves playing this role and and the character is just so so pleased with himself so like it's it's really fun to watch and I honestly I wish they had more screen time they do have a decent enough amount of screen time but yeah the, it was it was really really fun to watch and Keanu Reeves and Carrie Ann Moss have really great chemistry and this is like yeah that that helps a lot Yahya Abdul Mateen the second it's not really yeah it's not a spoiler he plays Morpheus and he does an incredible job like it's it's this it's not an impersonation it's a it's uh, what's the word it's like an reinterpretation essentially and yeah there are varying there there are some various re returning cast members and Neil Patrick Harris plays the analyst Doogie Howser became a therapist cool I think the movie does a pretty decent job of, you know, the the characters that are brought back. You know, it's been it's been eighteen years. Is this like are they? We we don't want to see them changed way too much, but we also don't want to see them be the exact same. You know, we eighteen years. If they haven't changed at all, that's a little sad. Like, no nobody should stay the same. For 18 years of their life, you know. So, I th I think the movie does a pretty good job. No, no one feels like they just, you know, they're nobody's pretending like no time has passed. That would also be kind of sad, you know. That's the, like, yeah. So, I th I think they do do a, they find a good balance. No character in this felt to me so removed from what they were you know, when we saw them, that I couldn't recognize them. Having not watched, I'm, next week I will watch, ah, what's it called? The Last Jedi. Until I do so, I cannot comment on whether that movie changes one or more legacy characters beyond recognition. Now, I appreciate that it's also, you know, like, it's not really a surprise that Lana Wachowski didn't just put in, you know, there's not just like a diversity quota that they have to fill. The, the you know, she actually did make sure that some of them, like, they express perspectives that are are defined by who they are you know it's it's uh, we're not stuck with white guys trying to write what what you know what we white guys guess might you know I is that is that something women care about is that something that other minorities care about uh, let's, let's let's try let's try maybe it, it you know they have their own voice there are multiple minorities in this that say things that don't feel like they're written by an out-of-touch white guy who's trying to be hip because it'll draw in an audience. It, it feels genuine. Now, the dialogue is okay. There is still a bit, you know, there's a lot of exposition still. Now, in the Matrix trilogy, a lot of the dialogue, you know, one character will start to say something, or they'll say something that's vague, and another character will ask, you know, what, or why, or when, or who, and then the other character will continue to, you know, f finish their sentence, and 
after a while it starts to really it, it gets grating I don't think it happened as much in this one but I it, uh, maybe I don't know maybe they hid it better what if they hit it and the cinematography was handled by DP Daniel Masaseski and John Toll and let's see so Daniel right the yeah under the skin and yeah so some some other really interesting stuff and so John Toll has done a lot let's see and he also did Jupiter Ascending and Cloud Atlas, so he has worked with Lana before. So they must have a good working relationship. He he must really deliver, you know, cinematography that she considers great. He also did DP Iron Man three, Adjustment Bureau. Last Samurai, Vanilla Sky, Almost Famous, Thin Red Line, Braveheart, Legends of Fall. Yeah. So, let's see. Yeah, the movie does not have hyperactive cinematography when it should be more calm. I wouldn't say that it, it sadly is not that easy to follow. Uh, you know, some some of the action scenes. I'm gonna I'm gonna quote a fellow critic here. This uh, Katie gave it 58 out of 100. Where Resurrections really disappoints is in the staging of the action. The Hong Kong influenced long shots that made the Matrix so revolutionary are all but absent, replaced by rapid cuts that render the fight choreography less legible than in previous installments. It's it's really too bad. And another critic said, while there are cool moments of slow motion and bullet time effects that originally defined the franchise, most of the action set pieces, regardless of shootouts and fight scenes, are shot in incomprehensible camera work and choppily edited. It's it's really, really the filming editing and action of this movie. I get it. It's you know, they're they're based like Lana is trying to keep up. And I, I think there would be criticism if this movie did try to do action in the exact same way that the trilogy did. But this is, for one thing, this is too different. And for another, this is just bad. This is badly handled action. And that's not something that's, like, some, some very recent action movies have incredible cinematography, choreography, and editing. I should have thought of an example before I start. Right. Shang-Chi. Also martial arts heavy. Filmed really well. Edited really well. The choreography is unbelievable. So they're really, this movie doesn't have an excuse. You know, they could have, it, it is still being done. It's, you know, the the way Shang-Chi handles action is unusual, but it can still be done. You know, that movie doesn't feel like, oh, it's just, it's just the Matrix again, you know. And according to IMDb Trivia, this is the first film in the Matrix series that does not feature cinematography by Bill Pope, nor a score by Don Davis. And yeah, it shows. And sounds. And the... Right, so this was edited by Joseph Jet Sally who also edited Ninja Assassin. Let's see, that was, I, I believe the Wachowski sisters produced that one, so they maybe know from there, and a bunch of stuff that I don't know, including a bunch of TV, yeah. I don't have a lot to add about the editing that wasn't, oh, it's, yeah, the, the, at least the editing is only that kind of choppy during 
the action scenes, like during dialogue scenes, it's it's not completely you know all over the place, but it's yeah. That's the that's the most positive thing I can say. And, and yeah, there there are things in this movie that seem like, oh, this is gonna go on forever, and it actually goes on it goes by fairly fairly quickly compared to what you would expect. The effects are hit and miss. Like there's definitely some really incredible effects in this, but there's also stuff where it's just yeah. There's some really good stunt work as well. And Right, the, you know, one thing I will say, oh, actually, yeah, also, I'm not the first person to use the term stormtrooper aim about this, but yeah, that's, that's a problem for this movie. You know, the, the, it used to be, in, in the trilogy, the bad guys do have incredible aim. You know, every single time that they manage to aim a gun directly in the direction of one of the good guys, we're we're scared that this is gonna be it, you know. But then in this, like, just yeah. Now the trailer, uh, let's see. I guess that's yeah. Okay, so somewhat of a spoiler. Well, the trailer shows this action scene on a train, which immediately made you know reminded me of the the high, highway. Freeway, the freeway scene in Reloaded, which is definitely a positive thing. It is, it is quite a good scene. No more spoilers for the time being. In general, like on paper, the action scene should be a lot better because there are some really clever ideas for for scenarios and such. It's just the way that they're filmed and the the choreography of them, and and the editing. That that's the, yeah. That's what leaves something to be desired. But yeah, the action includes chases on foot and in vehicles, physical fights, shooting, including shooting while in vehicles. Now, I... See. Yeah, I already mentioned the... There's at least one villain. It's very, very memorable. And... The relationship between the villain and Neo is also really great. So the music was handled by Johnny Klemek, who, in addition to, oh right, and Tom Tyker, and yeah, I don't know that much of. Uh, let's see. So yeah, Cloud Atlas. One hour photo. Tangled, but not that tangled. Run, Lola, run. And Sense 8. So, yeah, the. Yeah, both of them did music for Cloud Atlas, so that was all, something else that um, Lana Wachowski worked on. Right, and yeah, they both did for Run, Lola, run. Didn't Tom Tyker also direct? I might be thinking of someone. Anyway. <laughs> but yeah, the I don't, I don't, the music isn't bad. It's just not as anywhere near as memorable. And there are a couple of times where they use music from the trilogy and it really stood out to me. Like, I don't know if I necessarily say it was a good thing or a bad thing. I, I didn't mind all the referencing mostly, but yeah. Now the, I think it was in an interview. the The cast said that this movie would be lighter, have more humor than the trilogy, and for sure, there's there's some of that. And and some of that, I guess, yeah, maybe maybe 
self-deprecating is probably a good way to describe. And that's what bothered, you know, that's one of the things that have bothered some people. So the movie, let's see, without end credits, it is two hours and 17 minutes, and with them, another 11. So the best element of this movie is the the things that it brings in that fit in the Matrix world without being something we've seen before. And the worst aspect, let's see, it's, yeah, I, I have a couple of Ideas for the worst aspect. The ending, the handling of the action, meaning choreography, cinematography, and editing, and the, the kind of generic look and feel and how it's, it doesn't feel like it's anywhere near as expensively made as you know, some some people say it, it looks like a Netflix thing. I don't have Netflix, which I'm now more grateful for than ever. But I pay, yeah, I I have heard that like Netflix movies don't feel like big budget movies. Even some of the ones that have big budgets. Now, but yeah, I. You know, it's it's one of those that's the worst, and I definitely do think that it's a problem. So the thing I was most worried about was that the movie was just not going to have anything new to add, slash that it would feel too much like it didn't deliver, like it's it's undoing stuff from from yeah. I think the movie more or less as maybe a little bit exceeded my expectations but otherwise lived down to them and the thing I was most looking forward to was more of the Matrix world and yeah the movie exceeded my expectations the trailers do give away too much I think every single of the trailers gives at least a little bit too much away. They do also give you a good idea of what the movie is like. And you can see the cover and posters. Let's see them. I th I think it's it's fine. And it, uh, as far as spoilers go, it I don't think, right? And and you know they give you a decent idea of what the movie is like. On Rotten Tomatoes, this has sixty three percent based on three hundred seven reviews, and a sixty three percent audience score. It's not often that you see the, the critics and the audience agree quite that much. I guess that means that if any of the viewers say, oh, the, the critics must have been paid off to, to vote the way they did, or to rate, rate it the way they did, then they themselves would also have had to have been paid. That is such a, such a silly... Why, why would you ruin your reputation just for just for money anyway if they were politicians I would believe it and yeah there, there's tw oh, more than 2500 verified ratings and of the 307 194 are fresh and the average rating is 6.20 out of 10 and the 
audience score, the, the average rating is 3.6 out of 5. So yeah, the movie is fresh. I, you know, some of the people talking about how disappointed they were, you'd think it was rotten, but yeah. And on Metacritic, the critics, you know, the critic rating is 63 out of 100, but the user score is 3.8 out of 10. And there are a lot of angry reviewers who rated it very low on there. On IMDb, it has a 5.7 out of 10. And it's actually the most... Yeah, 18.7% gave it 6, 16% gave it 7, 9.7 gave it 8, 14.7 gave it 5, 8.9 gave it 4, so yeah. Now... So, yeah, my rating, I guess at the end of the day, it's going to be, six bland action scenes out of ten. So, yeah, the, the, you know, yeah. The ranking of these four movies from worst to best. Resurrections with six, Revolutions with seven, Reloaded with seven, and the original ten, um, the original ten out of ten. Now, let's see. So, that brings us to the next section. section start disclaimers and from here on out there are the spoilers if you don't care about these disclaimers I try to keep them short and relevant but your mileage may vary you can skip right ahead to the section of your choice in the description box I often try to talk very fast for the disclaimers since a lot of this is very standard information I'm not going to keep speaking as fast as I sometimes do during this section once I get to the rest of the video itself with that said please do note that some of the specific discussion on the may be in this section so, once again, from here on out, spoilers for everything Matrix. So, this is where I would get into, am I glad that this is a sequel or soft reboot? I mean, it's hard to say without knowing, like, I guess if the movie continues to perform as badly as it has so far, you know, yeah, it, it looks like we might not get another or it won't be anytime soon or yeah if I knew for sure that they were definitely making more movies I think they set up some interesting stuff here you know I appreciate that Zion is now IO and yeah these these various you know th yeah things that have changed I think there's there's some there's room for something interesting, but we don't see the interesting thing. You know, I, I saw at least one other person say, you know, maybe it would be interesting to see this war that they talk about. You know, they just and that's I, I really I, I I don't think you should put action beats in a trailer that aren't expanded into a scene. Because there's that brief bit in the trailer where you see some ships shooting each other, and it's it's as short in the movie as it is in the trailer. I think that that war might be interesting to watch, and maybe it's it's possible. It's possible if they make more movies that at least one of the movies will show us some of that war. And I get you know they had to first you know proof of concept just say oh see we can still make a Matrix movie a Matrix movie can still make a lot of money. Next time we'll do something daring. I think there's a lot of this world that there's so many interesting stories that you could tell. And and it's just, you know, this is just, they, they basically try to do the, the entire trilogy, speed run through the trilogy, you know, 
And I think there are a couple of interesting things in here that I just, I wish they had been better executed, but the idea of going to the the fields of of humans grown and and stealing you know one of these you know that that's how they get trinity out of there i just wish it it i think it should have looked more difficult the movie should have spent more time building up to it and carrying it out at the end of the day it, it kind of felt like they just rushed through Anyway, but it's it's a really cool idea, and it's not something we've seen before, but it is something, you know, like, hypothetically, if, 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 if the, if in 1999, someone had time traveled back and told me, so you know that movie, The Matrix, the fields of endless humans, you know how it looks like, you know, that would be impossible to get in there? There's going to be a movie where they go there and they grab a body and then they leave with, you know, that's, that's epic. That's incredible. And I really, I, I do think the, the train scene is, is fun. I, I forget who it was, but I heard someone say, you know, I mean, do we really need more, you know, high octane action scenes set on vehicles moving really fast? Yes. Yes, we do. The answer is yes hands down no just 100% yes it's it's incredible and and this thing of like they take one of the enemies and throw them out and we see them like you know go out and they fly past and and the end where they're you know trinity's driving the motorcycle and that's honestly i've i've wanted to see the two of them on the same motorcycle like that since the first movie, you know, it's it's wild that it's only now we're we're getting it. But yeah, the you know speed, you know, she's she's driving around. He's like every so often there'll be a car and he'll use the force push to get it out of the way. And there's like swarms bots, so, something like that. So, yeah, swarms of bots attacking, and they're like zombies and just like yeah. I never thought I would see something like that in, in a Matrix movie, but, you know, why not? Why wouldn't they do that? Why couldn't they do that? You know, it's... I, f I feel like it's basically that the architect used to be in charge, and he wasn't willing to do that kind of thing. You know, he's like, I can't waste that much. That's ridiculous. But the analyst, he's like, they're right there. Go get them, you know. And the, this idea that the, the robots and programs are now, you know, some of them are working with the, the I forget, did, did they have a name? Rebels? The, the, I, I forget, but yeah, I'm going to go with Rebels. I really love that this movie says we're stronger united, we're stronger together, and we can make a better world if we work together. It, it, you know, it's it's not subtle. The the Matrix, they're not they're not known for their subtle. There's some subtle stuff in there. Don't get me wrong, but they're not always subtle about. You know, they're basically like Niobe might as well look directly into the camera lens and say, see. Back when we fought the other, when we fought the other, we had a lot harder of a time surviving. But now that we work with them, we acknowledge their humanity. We're doing a lot better. And, you know, like, in the original trilogy, it was like, are we ever going to be free? Are we ever going to not worry about the machines? And then in this, it's like, you know, things are kind of going really well. I'm, I'm, please don't overturn my apple cart, Neo. Please just leave things be. I'm happy the way things are, you know. The, the sh like, Niobe went from, like, rebel number one to status quo warrior. It's just, yeah. And, and, like, they literally, like, they 
practically spell out, you know, N like Neo's like strawberry. How does this, you know? And Niobe's like, well, you wouldn't be able to do it without this guy who does things differently than we do. But we're not so different. Wink, you know, just like it's not subtle. But it's appreciated. It's welcome. And it is, like, when they made the original movie, they couldn't have known about 9-11. So I get why they, with the sequels, brought in this idea of, you know, maybe some of the machines aren't so bad. So maybe there could be a truce. Maybe there could be peace. You know, because the Wachowskis didn't want to be feeding this... Yeah, what's the word? Like, they didn't, they didn't want to be part of keeping the Forever Wars going. You know, it's, it's very telling when you look at some of the movies, you know, Matrix Revolutions and X-Men 2 both came out in 2003 and both were very clearly critical of the rampant xenophobia and Islamophobia that helped lead a lot of American, just like regular people, to be fine with the war on terror because they're the other, and you know, I'm constantly being told how awful they are. And then you have these two movies that go in and are like, you know, really help humanize the other, you know, yeah, the you know, obviously 9 11 was terrible. And, you know, if they, if the hijackers had survived, they should, you know, they should have to go on trial and such. But invading entire nations because of the actions of so few that weren't even military, you know, it's completely absurd. It, it's, anyway, you know, you have movies like that, and then you also have a movie like 300, which is all like, yes, white men... If they're masculine enough, they can defeat any, you know, the the any non-white group that that happens to come into one of our nations. We can fight them off heroically, and so you know, it really speaks to the the people making these movies. And yeah, you know, I I don't. I don't think that the world was as ready for this movie's message when they made the the trilogy, but today, yeah, like you know, when yeah, the the trilogy, the, the original movie especially is like we have to destroy the system. The system is is the the thing that's you know that's why we're not better off than we are, and this movie. You know, there there is still a system, there is still a matrix, but now it's this thing of we have to work together to take, you know, if, if we are to improve things, we have to work together. And that is the thing, like, you know, the, the, the idea, like, the idea of unions was, you know, around back then, but today we really realize, you know, it's not just about, it, you know, it doesn't make sense for us to fight each other. We need to, you know, if, if you know, all of us who have less power than the powerful need to unite against the powerful, not let the powerful distract us into fighting each other. So, the rest of this video is now a review. It's a series of, well, thoughts. Some is analysis, some is MSCTK, Riff Jacks, and other jokes. The time codes for all the sections are in the description box. The section right after this one is thoughts I have while watching, chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting, or the like. And the section after that is thoughts I had before watching. Does the movie appear to have empathy for the least likable characters? That would definitely be Smith and the Analyst. Not especially, no. That like over the course of the trilogy, 
we really come to understand a lot about Smith, his anxieties and drives and such. Here, it's he's he's fairly one-dimensional. You know, there's the you know he's like ah now our alliance will you know will end because there's no more you know yeah. I, I did talk briefly about, I, now I'll go into to detail, I thought the analyst, like, he's having so much fun, like, I don't know if I love the scene where he, you know, he's like, ah, oh, we're using bullet time against you, that's not bullet time, bullet time is the camera spinning around, it, like, he's talking about rewinding, why doesn't he just, I, I think they should have just said, you know, they should have just called it rewinding instead, but yeah. I don't know that I love the scene. I, I certainly think that some... It doesn't... I think it's trying to look cool, and I don't think it completely gets there. You know, there, there are things in the trilogy that are trying to look cool, and they almost always get there. But him, just like, he's loving it. Like, he's... Like, the, the architect was an enjoyable bad guy, but he was very restrained, and the analyst... It's just like, oh, can you believe this? I can't believe you really bought this. This, you know, this guy, he's totally working for us. I know, we used to just plop agent code into a person. That's so, way, you know, why Why should we, you know, what was it he said? Then we have to wait for them to notice one of you. Instead, we can just have specific people that are always working for it, you know, just... Yeah, he's 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 a lot of fun, and and I want to say Jonathan Groff takes over playing Smith. I mean, I will never say something negative. Like, I don't think I'm I. I don't think I've ever seen a Hugo Weaving performance where I was like, you know what, I could have been better. That I a little, little bit. No, there's he's he's always incredible. Like the, there are movies that are barely I barely remember, but I remember him in them. You know the Benicio del Toro's Wolfman, for example. Like I remember nothing else about that movie, but man, he was he was really good in it. But you know, Jonathan Groff, it's not it's not bad. It's a it's a pretty good like if you have you know I I don't know I mean I guess what's his name. Ross Marquand was busy because yeah, you know that's what they did in the MCU. You know, let's say how many times have they? There's been twice where he showed up in the flesh, and is it also twice in the? There's also a couple of voice roles, but yeah, I, I'm pretty sure his name is Ross Marquand. He took over for the Hugo Weaving role. I, yeah, I, I'm not 100% certain why they didn't use him here, but Jonathan Groff is really, really great. And again, the 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 just the deliciously, just yeah, like he he's, you know, he's like, you know, I've I've had these these dreams too. Now, I mean, really, they're just violent revenge fantasies, and I really want to carry them out. Just yeah. Now. I appreciate that the movie treats the various minorities well. Let me talk about that. I think the movie does a decent job not like overexposed the we never get used to the sight of agents, bots, swarms, squids, you know, it's always uh what's the word? There's never Um, yeah, we, we never just get accustomed to it. Now, my making jokes on this should not necessarily be taken as me thinking the thing I'm joking about is actually bad, and you want to make light of the subject, etc. So to find it very difficult not to insignificant overanalyze everything I watch. And that brings us to the next section. Notes taken while watching. 
I managed to almost fill out a, a pad this time. Yeah. So. Come on, dive right in. I have to admit the the thing with like how <sighs> Morpheus starts out as Smith in this that was interesting. That's like and and you know the uh the other character Bugs you know she tells him unplugging a program is the same process as unplugging a person. And just the, yeah, like, it's, it's, so, he starts out as Agent Smith, basically, in the, in the modal, was that what they called it? And then he wakes up and becomes Morpheus. It was, it was interesting. It was definitely, yeah. Um. Yeah, I I kind of like, you know, the Yeah, yeah, right, cuz when we first see Yahya Abdul Mateen the second, he's doing Smith in at the start of the first Matrix, you know, he shows up, no temperature, men are already dead. And members of the new cast watch stuff from the first movie trying to like figure out what's going on and I I thought that was kind of interesting because the first time you see the first movie you're you're like what's going on but now that we're watching it again you know we know what's going on and the characters you know the new members of the, the cast they also have you know they they recognize it they talk about well this is this is what happened in the in, in the thing, you know. And so the 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 um this idea that th then they're like, wait, there's something going on here that shouldn't you know, that's that's a good way to to because it would be like we've seen we've seen Trinity, you know, kicking cop ass and then escape, you know, like you don't, even, even if you haven't watched the original Matrix, you've seen that. They did that, I want to say the movie's called The Perfect Score, and there's a bunch of other scene, you know, other movies that parody the scene, like, you know, we know what happens in that scene. And then to have this thing of like, I want to say it's Bugs looking and she's like, that's not supposed to happen, you know, that's, that's interesting. And Morpheus and Bugs talk. And Bugs is a big fan of Neo and Trinity. I, oh, right, and, and the, they awoke without being woken up specifically by people. You know, you have the... Actually, did both of them see someone that is something like that, you know? But certainly, Bugs saw Neo walk off a roof, and that... Yeah, that meant that she was able to, to wake up from, you know, I, I quite like that, you know, in, in the Animatrix, they also do this thing of, like, what if someone could wake up without being found? You know, it happens with, yeah, I mentioned I was going to spoil, I forget his name, Daniel, maybe? The, the, um, ah, crap, I also forget the specific short, I, I, uh, world record, I believe it's called world record where he becomes aware that there's something else going on, you know. And, yeah, doing that in one of the movies, having someone wake up like that, I, I thought it was a, an interesting idea. And, and also, like, for the entire movie, we, you know, Bugs is one of the major characters, and she is someone who, you know, Neo 
woke up. And that's also, you know, like with, like with our Star Wars Episode 7, you know, it is this thing of the new characters are in awe of the legacy characters the way that the audience is in awe of them. And, yeah, it, it works well in, in both. I like that the hallway of doors, you know, now, now it's just being used by all, uh, wait, is it all agents? And that, now I'm not 100, uh, various characters, certainly. You know, so this, I mean, yeah, it is a different mage. I'm not 100% certain if that, what, what was it they called it? Im Malcium, Imalcium? I, f I forget exactly. I'm not 100% certain if that's just the entire Matrix now, or if that was only referring to that one special area where Neo and Trinity were. Anyway, but yeah, the the I'm I'm just gonna call it Matrix. Yeah, I'm just gonna call it Matrix. But yeah, you know, this is basically a new Matrix, and now. You don't have to know Sarah for the Keymaker to access the hallway. And now some of the doors are, like, will swap between the vertical and the horizontal when you go through. That was really cool. And the, this thing of, like, using mirrors as, as portals. And, you know, Bo specifically says the... Uh, what's the... Um... We we don't have to you we don't have to rely on hard lines to to go in and out anymore so something like that you know which is also I'm not I'm glad that that was the case in the original trilogy or I guess the original two that it doesn't really come up in the third one but yeah I'm glad that they've changed it because that's you know, let's let's try to do something different. Let's try to do something new, and yeah, it yeah, and I I do think it was a decent enough idea. This thing of you know, the Matrix trilogy in this movie is a series of video games that Thomas created, and. There are a number of characters who are fans of the legacy cast, similar to the stories of episode seven. And and Neo when when talking to the the CEO of the video game company, you know, we see some clips of you know, basically he's hallucinating. And it is the, so, so basically the idea is supposed to be that they decided that they were going to tell him, no, 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 Matrix, you know, it's, it's video games. It's not, so, so it doesn't feel like, cause, so, so he has something to put to, you know, it's, it's, I think they even spell, they even specifically say that in this movie, that if you think that reality was just like, cause, cause if they just said no, that never happened. That, that has nothing to do with anything, you know. But if they say no, no it's, it's it's just video games, you know. Oh well, of course. Like every so often, you're gonna, cause he put himself into the video games, so of course he'll occasionally dream of something that's similar to the video games, because that was something that he put in there. That's a that's a decent enough, yeah. And, yeah, you know, Keanu Reeves is sitting there staring at this other person who, you know, their body starts doing something that they don't themselves seem to react to, but Keanu Reeves is clearly reacting. So I'm just relieved that in this case it was not that the guy was turning into a giant cockroach. Is that too, too deep of a cut? I just realized it sounded like I was criticizing that movie. I love that movie. Yeah. 
and you know the the analyst tells Neo to, to uh, yeah Neo that he you know he tried to commit suicide by jumping off of a building and that you know that's why he's now he he needs to be be you know he need, he he has to be careful about these like ideas you know so, sometimes he has trouble distinguishing between reality and hallucination and the hallucinations can be dangerous for him so that's a really great way to convince someone to not try to to break out of of this kind of system and i like that when the when smith shot him in the face he wakes up and he's in am i remembering that right C certainly there was something how however whatever exactly did happen at the video game you know at, at the building it ended you know suddenly neo is at the analyst and and the analyst is like do you remember how you got here and it's that's a, that's a very clever cuz that is like he's not you know that's basic that's what the analyst wants he doesn't want neo dead he spent considerable effort rebuilding his body after all he just wants him subdued he wants to keep him in this kind of like he wants to make sure he can control him and yeah saying the things you think aren't real they aren't real but they could be dangerous so you have to take these pills that suppress it and it's just yeah And basically, you know, the movie, in, in this movie, Neo is supposed to make, yes, I realize that other characters refer to him as Thomas, but I, I, I hope I'm saying this right. In the original, that when Neo was referred to by his birth name, that was, you know, that was like... I hope I'm using this term correctly, dead naming him, which is when someone refers to a trans individual by the, the, the name that they went by before they transitioned. And so it is, it's hurtful to, to, so I will not be calling him Thomas in this. But yeah, Neo in the fourth matrix movie is told to make the fourth matrix video game and that is and they you know they have it's, it's cool to see Christina Ricci again and and they really do just come right out and say you know we're basically being forced into doing this but you know we'll try to make it work whatever and we have this montage of days worth of brainstorming I don't know. I've, I, th I think that was something that didn't completely work. The the. Yeah, it just felt. I don't think it was actually a long sequence, but it felt like it went on for too long. And it was a little too self-indulgent. Like it didn't really, it didn't really go anywhere, especially. I like, you know, when, when Neo talks to, I'm also not going to be calling her Tiffany because she, she says she hates that name. So when Neo talks to Trinity, you know, she points out, you know, women are expected to have kids. So she wonders, you know, did she actually want to, or was it just that kind of, I think she used the term social programming and yeah I, I really appreciate you know because that is like that that is a societal expectation and it really shouldn't be it is like I understand 
obviously some some people need to at least be raising children. I personally think you should adopt before having your own. And as long as there's even a single child out there waiting to be adopted, you shouldn't have a child of your own before adopting. Anyway, so, you know, yeah, for, for sure, you know, some people need to be taking care of these children, but I don't think it's reasonable to try to push that upon everyone. Some people don't make good parents. And Trinity... Yeah, Neo and Trinity both realize that, you know, the character of Trinity in the video games looks a lot like Trinity in, in the Matrix. And, you know, the, like, the, the two of them realize that, but Chad, he doesn't real you know, he doesn't see it at all. And the, yeah, so, so Neo is, you know, at his job and, you know, in, in the, in the, original movie. Morpheus calls him on the cell phone that he has delivered to him. And he tells he directs him to, to where to go and such. In this it's a text. Because even if the future of the world is at risk, I mean do we really need to have a conversation on the phone? Can we just text? I think that was the movie being like making fun of that idea that like today nobody calls anybody we just we text instead and i will say when when morpheus walks out of you know opens the bathroom stall door and walks out okay we get it you're trying to have fun with it and not be as you know the the movie and the character even point out you know oh i'm just walking out of the bathroom even though in in the original one it was this really epic thing. It's just yeah, that that was. I think that might have been one of the things where people really felt like, okay, now you're just taking the piss. And after you took the piss, then you opened the stall door and had the character walk out. Like it's yeah. And I have to admit. When I heard the, you know, when, when we heard you seem particularly triggered right now, when we heard that in the trailer, you know, I was like, oh, great. another uh, No, actually, at the time, I wasn't entirely sure. Are they, are they using that right? Or is it, you know, and I've heard some people say, oh, you know, it's basically making fun of it because the, the whole, you know, the, the millennial generation or that kind of thing. You know, by the end of the movie, we know that the analyst is a villain, but I mean, he does kind of use that term correctly. Like he's talking, you know, he says you seem particularly triggered right now. While Neo is sitting there and he's like got this anxiety and he's he's like he's struggling to discern between reality and fiction. Yeah, you know that is like the wrong use of the term trigger. Is to just say, oh, it's just someone who's upset about something, or angry about something, you know. But no trigger, it, like he's he's having a a he's having problems, and yeah, it was it was the right use of it. Which I mean, the the Wachowskis tend to be good about that, not not making fun of people's trauma. I'm not sure why people hate this movie's use of clips from the first three so much. I, I mean, it's essentially, in in part, it's expressing that Neo's having trouble, like figuring out what what is real and what is just. Ah, uh, what's the word? 
yeah what what is real and and you know the the it's it's, it's basically it's these repressed memories coming to the surface I have to admit, when Neo almost stepped off the building, you know, he's he's really drunk, which is, <laughs> yeah. And and the, I thought that he was actually going to, completely. Yeah, go go over the and and, I I wasn't entirely sure if that meant, then he's gonna get free of the or or what, but then Bug stops him. You know, she pulls him off. Not like that. And she tells Neo and the audience that now the, you know, the, the agents are still a thing, but now they also have these bots who look just like regular people, which is a clever, you know, yeah, I quite appreciate because we already, we did the thing, we, we had three movies where, you know, and, and several games where agents can take over normal people and, you know, one at a time and only one within, yeah. I, I quite like that they can all be turned into, you know, I, I just watched the, the pitch meeting as I was setting up the camera and, and he was like, well, they used to not you know so so now they're just wasting a lot of these you know humans being used for energy i mean as long you know in order to stop neo and trinity yeah cuz they're the biggest sources of energy so you know like i i i really don't think that's an unreasonable besides it's the analyst who's in charge now, and he's a very different person than the architect was. And... I forget what character it is that says it, but someone maybe says that nostalgia is comforting and we're told that it's been 60 years since revolutions and they've been looking for Neo for all of that time and they couldn't find him because in mirrors he looks different from yeah right some people really hated the old people makeup on Neo and Naomi yeah it's bad I I don't know what yeah and the analyst tries to snap Neo out of it when he goes through the mirror. I, in in theory, I like that the operator is now visible to the the person that the operator is talking to. I just wish they did something with it. But again, it's like I I think if they make at least one more movie, I think they might do something interesting with it. But, it, I mean, it is this thing of, like, the moment that you can place him in the scene, like, we, we get that, oh, okay, only the person that he's talking to can actually see him. But that means that you don't have to cut from the action to the operator watching the action, which, that can work, but it can also kind of pull you out of it. But the moment that he's in the scene, just, yeah. And it allows the the actors to play off each other which it, it's the moment that you're editing you're probably not going to use the same take of you know when when one like maybe maybe the operator character gets the line perfect in take five but like neo who's talking to gets his line perfect in take seven so it's not quite the same, but the moment that they're both in the same room near each other, they can play off each other. I've I've seen some people say that the this movie's like a parody of the 
uh, what's it called? The original trilogy. I I think of it as a, a tribute, not a parody. I quite like that. Like basically, Morpheus is kind of high on being Morpheus and Smith. Like he's he's so excited about this thing and like you know the the Morpheus as we saw in in the original trilogy was also like really ecstatic about this whole thing with the one but there's just there's a slightly different energy to it here and I'm I'm digging it I'm digging it like a squid drill through rock near Zion Right, and the, yeah, they say, if you don't know the truth, then you can't fight it. So, something like that. And... Yeah, the, there was peace due to Neo's sacrifice, even though he feels like it didn't matter. I have to admit, like, over and over, they would like bugs would refer to sequoia as seek and the subtitles wrote s e q i kept thinking that must be short for sequence since it's all about hacking but no sequoia fair enough I didn't think his performance was wooden. I think he rocks. And let's see. I I kind of like that. There's like a neo neologist, and and like neo is for a second like, what does that does that mean? What I think it means, and just yeah. That's not literally word for word what he says, but that's what I got from his, when he asked. Like, he was clearly like, holy crap, there are people who study me. That's that's what that, and, you know, Morpheus is made up of these nanoparticles on the, you know, because cause he's still, he doesn't have, he doesn't quite have a corporeal form. So he just, yes. That that is quite yeah. And let's see. Oh right, and they yeah, they can't free Trinity Trinity and New Zion and Io and they arrive and then they're being yelled at for disobedience and now Niobe is a general she used to be a captain and she demotes bugs so she's no longer a captain and says she can't fly anymore and yeah Niobe admits she was pessimistic for a really long time but she isn't anymore because she sees how good things can be and that's also that's just that's the kind of thing we need to hear right now if we work hard things can be great you know there's it's it's really easy to lose hope these days because so many have fought for so long and there's still so much injustice but you know with enough time you know, if you if you hang in for long enough, you know there there are some things that are get that are getting better because of the the fight for equality. No.
and yeah, Neo keeps bringing up how he wants to free Trinity. I think that is a, a good, like, the first movie basically is about if Neo really, you know, we're, we're learning about what the Matrix is, and then the rest of the movie is about is Neo really the one, and, you know, exactly how much can he do, how far can he go for, and, and this idea that the, Um, you know, that, that works well for the one movie, but yeah, for this one to have this thing of, you know, he wants to free, which actually, I guess, uh, yeah, the second movie is about how he has to try to figure out how to save her life even though he's having these dreams where she dies, but... But the, yeah, the second one is also, you know, there's this stuff about the Oracle and the stuff about the the machines digging, so... But yeah, this one is... 100% about, you know, he, he gets freed and then he wants to, to free her. I like Morpheus calling it the Rapunzel Tower. And they go through Trinity. Some people really hated how the Merovingian was in this. I didn't really care that much one way or the other. I, f I felt like... You know, they needed to do something different with him. If he just came back and was the same, you know. But I understand those who say that it, it wasn't very dignified, for sure. You know, one of the problems with this movie is that everything that was good about the trilogy, it is either gone or diluted in this the the part where they're fighting exiles and the Merovingian is right there it kind of reminds me of parts of Path of Neo so I guess this is this really is what ends up w where Lana Wachowski goes if she goes far off the beaten path of the sequels just the the setting and the mechanics of the the fighting and yeah So Neo goes to talk to Trinity where she fixes bikes. And the analyst is the new is revealed as the new architect. I really appreciate that they do confront head on. Yeah, their bodies were pretty messed up. But they, you know, the robots rebuilt them. And honestly, I don't have a problem accepting that as something that like I mean, considering what we see them able to do in these movies, you know, the question was more why, and in this we're told, it, you know, when the two of them are close together, they generate a lot of energy that they don't generate when they're apart. And that is also, like, I, d I don't know if that is a... I mean, on its face, that works as a, is that even a metaphor for romantic love? You know, for your soulmate. When you are together, you're powerful. When you're apart, it feels like something's missing. I don't know if it could also, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but I can't help but wonder if you could read it as a trans metaphor that yeah, now that I think about it, it's probably a non-binary metaphor because it's limiting when you're stuck 
as either a man or a woman, but if you possess both in you, if you if you live at peace with both, yeah, with with multiple different parts, then you you know as non-binary, then that's that's when you're at your best. I think I think that might be I don't know maybe it's a stretch, but I I I, th I think that works. I'm I'm not trying to pat myself on the back. I'm saying I think Lana did a good job making that work. I think that metaphor works. Yeah. Whether you want to read it as non-binary or trans, that the the yeah non-binary because the two of them together and trans. I mean yeah. Let's see. If if you want to read it as trans, you could say that Trinity wants to become wants to transition to Neo and Neo wants to transition to Trinity. So when the when they reach that goal, they are more powerful. They are at their best. And the the when the analyst explained nightmares and says this this is what we're doing, you know, nightmares, mea culpa, that's us. And and this is why you know that was that was really good as as a just and it's just like I mean he talks and moves exactly the way you would think someone who like m makes bad dreams would you know it's it's this or it's Freddy Krueger I I yeah I really do hope that it may. I hope they make a sequel, and I hope the analyst is a much bigger character. Honestly, I'd watch a spin-off just 100% about him. Now, let's see. So, yeah, Niobe says she doesn't. She's too old to give them a proper trial, and the the ship. Let's see. And and yeah, and we find out that Sati kept Neo secret. The just they the anoleum, that's right, that's what it's called. And Niobe asks I, I like that you know, Niobe is like, okay, so someone's gonna have to go out there and you know, and Bug steps up. What are you doing? I'm volunteering. Oh no 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 no. You were going. There was never any question. You are definitely going. You, I'm ordering you to go. I also need two volunteers, and just everybody steps forward. Because F lock, right? Just like... <laughs> and they were married. Like, he's, I, I, I mean, they don't mention him at all. I, I could imagine he's, he's long dead by now. Maybe he's watching from the afterlife. He's like, oh, come on. You know, just like... I got I did the military strategy. I kept my cool around Morpheus, around the council. I stopped a lot of sentinels and nobody wants to you know, just, I'm like, um, I don't think we have enough volunteers. I guess we don't have enough volunteers. I guess we're just gonna have to keep every single ship here. Sorry, and then you know his his wife steps forward and he's like, "Really?" <laughs> and now everybody volunteers because just yeah. I am really glad of of all the the characters that you know a lot of characters didn't return. I'm really glad Naomi is one of the ones who did return. I I you know. People don't always give Jada Pinkett Smith enough credit. She really can sell this stuff. And it really, like, just, yeah. And I like the bit with, you know, like, Neo is like, but you gave up your ship. And she's like, yeah, but, and, yeah. And, and we're told that Sati's parents were purged, so she wants revenge. That's why she helps with the with freeing Trinity, and that's what you know. She didn't come up with that plan just off the top of her. She she's been waiting for you know to be able to do something like that for a long time for the. And that is also a, a neat little like in 
the actual in in revolutions we're told that sati was supposed to not have been created in the first place and if the machines capture her she will be deleted she yeah and now she is still there but her parents were deleted so that's a, a good little yeah and neo believes the trinity will go with them just on faith I like how the swarm is like this zombie horde attacking. Now, let's see. Um, it was kind of messed up with that, like. You know, the, there's this couple in bed, and the husband, like, his eyes turn, you know, get, get the green matrix coat on them. And then he gets up, and he runs, and he jumps out the window, and then we see, like, I don't know, dozens more people do that. That was, yeah. I forget which character, but at least one of the characters was apparently re referred to as... Lexi, but it sounded to me like the other character said Legsy, and, and that just makes me want to watch some more Draga. Now, I, I really like when we see Neo stop bullets with with telekinesis in this basically in the at the end of the first movie it wasn't it wasn't really yeah in the first movie there at the end and in the second movie I don't know around the midpoint or whatever it wasn't really tense it was cool and it showed how powerful he was by that point but it wasn't really tense like when when we first see them raise their guns it's it's tense but then he holds up his hand and says no talk to the hand and it's cool but it's not tense but in this it seems like he has to keep putting in effort like it seems like he if he slips up for a second then they do get hit with bullets and they die so i i really appreciate that they they went because and this movie really would have been excruciating if every time he was stopping bullets or moving things with telekinesis, if it was never tense. But he got his ass kicked. You know, Morpheus kicked his ass. Smith kicked his ass, and then he, you know, fought back with with telekinesis, and then he got. But yeah, he he got real bad beat up before that. So it really does. Uh, yeah, and. Yeah. It, it you know it, it requires effort for Neo. It feels like it could fail with the telekinesis. It's not easy or cool for him. I mean it's cool looking, but it there's a there's a sense that it's, it feels visceral. You know, before it almost felt like a, a, a cheat code or something. Again, I think it's cool. I like it. But I'm glad that they changed it like this. And Neo and Trinity jump off the rooftop, and he falls, and she flies. And Trinity kicks the analyst's ass repeatedly, like knocking his 
his jaw off and like slitting his throat and just yeah. And the analyst says that people don't want freedom. Which felt like, you know, I, I really, he's, he's a really good villain. Like, you really want to see him taken down. But yeah, so at the end of this, you know, there's room for more Matrix films. I don't know how much interest there still is in more Matrix films. So in the third movie, we had the, the being known as Deus Ex, and then in this we have the video game company known as Deus Machina. There's already a movie called Ex Machina. And the... Yeah. The ending, I've seen others point out, we're basically now at the same point that we were at the end of the first movie. It's like, why are you why are you making another one if you're just going to end it in a similar spot? Like, it could be so interesting. Okay, let's see. Let's see. What would be a good... Okay, so it would be kind of a ridiculous cliffhanger. But let's say that this movie did end with Neo seemingly a prisoner in Io. And, you know, his allies don't have their ship anymore. They're, they've all been, you know, they're confined, you know, boom, end. You have to watch the next movie to see what happens next. Then we're at least like, okay, wow, I don't know how they're going to get out of this one. But here it's just like, yeah, they're in the same spot as like, you know, it's it's just, yeah. And the post credit scene, the cat tricks, the cat, yeah, I think that's how they pronounced it. I don't, why is, like, I, I think, you know, when I, when the, when the movie's end credits started rolling, I googled to see if there was a post credit scene at all. And... I think it was the top search result said was an article that said Matrix Resurrections post credit scene is an insult. And yeah, kind of. And that brings us to the final section. Entitled Notes Taken Before Watching. So, <laughs> IMDb trivia. According to Star Keanu Reeves, the spectacular tandem leap with Carrie Ann Moss from San Francisco's 44 Montgomery Street building was mostly accomplished without CG effects. Even though the building is officially 43 stories high, they had to climb a further two or three floors to reach the rooftop. The pair made the jump as many as 20 times over a two-day period with body descender cables attached. And it is a really epic part of the movie. Now... Trinity's alter ego, Tiffany, is now married to Chad, played by Chad Stahelski, who directed the John Wick series with Keanu Reeves. He, is, he, in fact, was the stunt double for Keanu Reeves in the original Matrix trilogy, hence both played Neo. In a way, Trinity is married to Neo. Now, hmm. 
the chi blasts used by Neo were originally conceived as one of his the one powers for the Matrix Reloaded, and remained in that movie script until quite a late stage of pre-production. It does feel like something that the character should be able to do. Now, the building that Neo and Trinity ended up in at the end of Downtown Office Skyscraper is reminiscent of the starting level of Enter the Matrix game, a medium-sized city post office. Very true. Okay, let's see. Okay, so the let's So the I am looking through the IMDB the frequently asked questions. Now. I think. Yeah, so. Right. I still don't love Reloaded and Revolutions, but I will say that in more recent years, I realized that some of the criticisms were just based on people not being ready for some of these movies doing things we haven't really seen before. The sex scene between Neo and Trinity, I saw some people criticize that it wasn't sexy, and they, they didn't say the following, but, you know, implying to straight people, you know, yeah, yeah, straight people wouldn't look at it and find it arousing. And I think I might have actually repeated that criticism in my own video, which I do now regret doing. 
you know, for a while, people kept thinking that sex scenes in movies were basically there for straight men to get horny from them. I've seen people say that the sex scenes in Black Swan are awkward. Or, yeah, the scenes dealing with sexuality in Black Swan are awkward, as if that's supposed to be a smart criticism of that movie. That's literally the point of those scenes. It's how she's not comfortable with her sexuality yet. But a bunch of straight white dudes saw that and couldn't wrap their heads around the idea that maybe scenes involving two attractive young women getting sexual might not be in the movie just so they could jerk off to it. Anyway, I think it was a video by, I think she's called Sophie from Mars. The Matrix sequels are good, actually. Sophie from Mars featuring Zara Zedek. And they pointed out, I have to admit, it's been a while, so I might be slightly misremembering, but I think it was something about that the sex scene between Neo and Trinity, the fact that you can't always tell which of the two you're looking at, which is something that bothers straight dudes who don't want to spend even a second leering at Keanu Reeves' naked body, is actually intentional. It's basically that these two individuals are becoming one. Two halves of the same whole. Now, let's see. So yeah, in, in the in the original trilogy, Neo is the only person who could, like, dodge bullets. But in Enter the Matrix and this, you know, other characters can move fast enough that they can avoid getting hit when, when someone is shooting. You know, someone knows that they're there and they're shooting to hit them and... Yeah, I, I wish that they had been, yeah, it's, it's frustrating. It makes it less, less tense. But that is my video on Matrix Resurrections. So let me know down in the comments, do you hope they make Matrix 5 and what what do you think we should see in it? What would be an interesting concept? Should it have these same characters or should it be like a prequel showing the war? Should it be, should they skip ahead in time or should they set it right after this movie? Let me know what you think. If you like this video, please comment, thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page and one, two or more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested view to watch on screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and giving spoiler thoughts on a movie and recently these videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoy watching and recording and I'll catch you next time.